Well, howdy, y'all. Unky T here. As promised, I've uh, come up with the second half of that last uh, video that I put out yesterday. Um, this will be part two of two. And I uh, hope you're getting something out of this and learn a little bit of something about how that when they all talk about everybody's a conspiracy theorist and all that stuff, it, it ain't theory. There are conspiracies out there that are universal. I mean, it's how is it every freaking university comes up with stuff like this and then they punish all the people who go dissenting against what they have to say? I don't know. But anyways, I'm just going to stop there and I'll let you all decide. So here's part two from yesterday. I hope you all enjoy it. I'll show that they don't have a, had a sense of humor a little bit as well. The case dragged on for, for some time, legal to, to and fro, and it was draining resources, but we decided to file in court to fight it, right? In my opinion, at that stage, the university wasn't expecting us to do that, and they weren't, certainly weren't expecting the, the fight or the really bad publicity that was coming about. So as soon as we filed, um, within a day or so, they gave me a final censure, your last thing, and told me to keep it secret. Uh, Except to my wife, they, they agreed that I could talk to her, which was nice of them. <laughs> and, and I confess at first that I'd got away with it, right? Well, I hadn't been fired, and I really thought I was going to get fired. And um, I was inclined to accept it. The final century, I'd, I'd kept my job. We'd fought the battle to a draw, and um, my wife disagreed, in fact. She said, you are now silenced and JCU has you where you want, they want you to be, with a gun to your head, with the final censure, and a muzzle on your mouth. I couldn't really say anything without taking the risk that I was going to get fired. And she was dead right. Uh, within a short time, I was supposed to give a talk at the Sydney Institute and the IPA, as I recall, and the JCU insisted on reading my PowerPoint presentations, and they asked for some parts to be removed and other, other parts to be modified. And when I did give the lecture at the Sydney Institute, some people asked some questions and I found that I actually couldn't answer the questions because of the restrictions that had been placed on me. So we weighed this up for a little while, and, but in the end, there was just no choice. We had to fight. The, what they were doing was wrong and, it, and we were going to fight it, even though we knew that this was going to raise the ire of, the J, of JCU even more and uh, take a considerable risk. So with the great assistance of the IPA, especially Matt Lesh over here, uh, we went for a, a GoFundMe campaign to raise $100,000 for the, the required legal assistance. And we got that $100,000 in two days with a GoFundMe, which was fun. And there may be some people here. Um, it was incredibly nerve wracking, but it was also a bit exciting as well, right? Seeing the money rack up. Now, to do that, I had to put all the information on the website, everything all the allegations, all 40-odd, uh, at this stage, 27 charges against me. And I did that because, well, firstly, I have a right to do that, in my view. Secondly, the public have a right to know what a public university is doing with their money. And thirdly, you can't say to people who you're trying to get some money off, JCU has accused me on for 27 counts of serious misconduct, please give me $100,000, but I can't tell you what it is about. Remember, donors, these donors, now I work at a university, I could have been touching up the first year ladies. They need to know everything, so I have to, I have to, well, it's true, isn't it? That's what people think. We, we, we're talking about 27 cases of serious misconduct. People start to wonder, well, what has this guy done? And that's why I had to tell people, hey guys, it's nothing bad, all right? I just said some things. All right, well, the, the GoFundMe campaign made JC really angry, especially as there was lots of very adverse publicity. So there was a third meeting with the Dean and I was given another brown envelope with a dozen or so new allegations. Again, they claimed that I broke the illegal secrecy uh, directive and they trawled up other matters, all of which I put online so that other people could judge whether I was guilty or not. My favorite allegation was an email I sent to an old friend an ex-college with the subject line of the email for your amusement and I and I attached a newspaper article about my case which was fairly uncomplimentary to JCU and I didn't say anything else right JCU claimed that for just sending that with for your amusement 
I'd broken the rule in our enterprise bargaining agreement that I'm not allowed to parody, vilify or satirise the disciplinary process. And by saying for amusement, I had done that. I've never heard anything more pathetic in my life. I must say, I laughed when I read that one. Well, anyway, it dragged on more to and fro with the legal people and I was finally fired. I was actually sitting under a palm tree in Bamaga on the tip of court, Cape York Peninsula when I got the phone call from the HR manager and he was jolly nice about it. And he, and he, 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 off, he offered me counselling just in case I was a... <laughs> just in case I was a bit upset about things. Right. So we said, to hell with that, we're going to go uh, for another GoFundMe. We need more cash, and we got $160,000 in three days. So thank you all for that much too. During the 10 months that this was going on, there was considerable media interest, which was almost all entirely unfavorable to the JCU. And I managed the incredible feat, I mean, very proud of this. I managed to get Andrew Bolt to agree with the ABC. <laughs> and also Breitbart to agree with the Guardian newspaper. That was how bad the, the publicity was for the, the university. Now you may wonder why JCU was so keen to keep all the allegations secret and you may think that it was because JCU might have think that it would reflect badly on them. Um, but actually by enforcing the secrecy provision, the illegal secrecy provision, the victim cannot get help and cannot organise resistance. The secret position is a, a powerful tool to control the academics, or in this case the proletariat, I guess. If I had not been able to talk to the IPA or do the GoFundMe campaign, I could never have got the legal help. I would have been fired much sooner and I would have had no, no hope of fighting back. So that's why this secrecy provision we're fighting so, so, so hard, because it means that uh, people can't fight back. I won't go into any mu much more detail on this. The court case will be held in uh, mid-November. The court case will not be fought on common decency. Uh, if it was, I would win. I have no doubt about that. But it's on the legal definition of the enterprise bargaining agreement. I know I'm off by heart. 54.1.5, section C is what it's going to be fought on. But anyway, we've got a good chance of success. We've got an excellent legal system, but it's not certain. All right, so what does this all mean? Well. The, that enterprise bargaining agreement does apply to other universities, or at least parts of it. Um, so what will happen if I win? Well, actually, all it proves that it is that if you could raise 260 grand of other people's money with a huge amount of help from the IPA and lawyers, a lot of grey hairs and angst, you might get your, dob, your job back. So what will other academics think? Well, they're going to say, whatever you do, don't do what Peter Ridd did, right? Just don't go towards the edge of that cliff. So academic freedom is thus effectively dead, although there will be this fiction because the judge might have upheld my case. The process will be the punishment, and the administrators will have got their own way. On the other hand, if I lose, well, that'll be bad, but we will at least have a court proclaim, in my view, well, that's the death of academic freedom because the university will have effectively written into the um, enterprise bargaining agreement that it is dead but by these other uh, provisions that they've put in. So we will know exactly where we stand and to be frank it's been pretty obvious for the last couple of decades that academic freedom has been dead. But we will have closure as they say nowadays and you can, uh, we can go ahead and bury the corpse. Academic freedom born in Bologna 1088 on life support since 1990 pronounced dead in 2018 will be fondly remembered. So you might wonder, well, would the academics care? Well, not really. R remember about 80% 80, 80 of the academics, at least, would be on the cultural left. Of the remainder, maybe only 10%, mostly in the engineering and hard science area, would be working in potentially, uh, sorry, not in those areas, would be working in potentially controversial fields. So, so they're not worried. So of those 2%, of the re remaining 2%, there will only be a few who will firstly have sort of the personality to fight, will have no mortgage and, no, and good superannuation. You know, I'm at the end of my career, so it doesn't really matter. People say it's brave. It's not brave. I'm near the end. I'm near retirement. In fact, there's a responsibility for people in my position to take these risks. But any anyway, day, what you end up with is about one in a thousand academics who are actually effective and willing to fight to do anything about it. So don't expect a groundswell from the... Um, the academics. 
So the big question, is academic freedom already dead in name? Well, probably. Do we give up on universities being the main font of our original thoughts and cradles of vigorous debate? And is it now, in fact, the blogs and the, the new media which are doing that? Well, in most fields, I think that is absolutely true. But in the sciences where I am, where you need money to actually uh, you know, do this research, and it's, I've been doing this for 25 or 30 years and come to these conclusions, you still need a decent university. And we don't have that. And we've also got the terrible problem that everybody talks about, that we are still entrusting our children to these people. And that's a big problem. So universities are definitely no longer a, a net benefit to the society. We really do need to uh, reform them. I have some ideas about how to do that. Well, anyway, I want to I leave on a sort of an upbeat note. So remember, the Great Barrier Reef is fine. It's actually bloody marvellous. So tell people that. Tell your children, because I know that there's a lot of very depressed children who have been told at their school that the thing's dead. And they're, re they're actually depressed about it, and it's not. And also, wish me luck in November. Thank you very much. <laughs>